Good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Melanie Israel, a research associate here at the Heritage Foundation in our DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society. And I'm so glad that all of you were able to join us today, both in person and online. Um, this is a pretty hefty topic to try to talk about in just one hour, but we are going to endeavor to hit as many points as we possibly can. Um, and ultimately, what we're hoping to get out of this discussion is a better understanding of how we should think about bioethics in a philosophical sense, a scientific sense, um, and really more just a broad cultural sense, um, both in civil society and the law. And so I want to, um, first of all, ask that everybody can silence your cell phone if you haven't already, and let you know that at the end of the program, we're going to have time for Q&A. If you do want to ask a question, please raise your hand, wait until you have a microphone. We'll have people walking around with microphones. Um, and then identify yourself and speak clearly into the microphone so that everyone joining online is able to hear your question. Um, to kick things off, I want to briefly introduce our panelists. First, we have Melissa Moschella. She is an assistant professor of philosophy at the Catholic University of America, where her teaching and research focuses on natural law, biomedical ethics, the moral and political status of the family. Dr. Michelle speaks and writes on a variety of contemporary moral issues, including brain death, end of life ethics, parental rights, reproductive technologies, and conscience rights. Then we've got Jennifer Law. She's the founder and president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network. The CBC works through a variety of media platforms, documentaries, writing, public speaking, and more to educate and inform members of the general public, thought leaders, and lawmakers on ethical issues in healthcare, biomedical research, and biotechnological advancement. She couples her 25 years of experience as a pediatric critical care nurse, a hospital admi administrator, and a senior level nursing manager with a deep passion to speak for those who have no voice. And then we have Dr. Tara Sander Lee. She's the Senior Fellow and Director of Life Sciences at the Charlotte Lozier Institute, which is an organization dedicated to policies and practices that protect the sanctity of human life. She's a scientist by trade with 20 years of experience in academic and clinical medicine with an emphasis on the cause of pediatric diseases. She obtained a PhD in biochemistry from the Medical College of Wisconsin and fellowship training at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. We've got a wonderful panel today. So Melissa, I'm gonna go ahead and kick things over to you to start us off. Thanks, Melanie, and thanks everybody for coming uh, to hear about and discuss, uh, I think, some very important topics for our culture today. Scientific innovations over the past half century or so have dramatically increased our technical mastery over human life, especially in its origins. Up until pretty recently in human history, human procreation has been outside of our direct control. If one wanted a child of one's own, um, one needed to do quaint things like find a willing partner of the opposite sex and be sexually intimate with that person, usually not just once, but regularly over a period of time, in hope that one of those encounters would lead to the conception of a new human being. And one also could only hope, but could not do anything to ensure that the child thus conceived would be relatively healthy. Fast forward to today, and things look quite different. Now, due to the development of in vitro fertilization, it's possible to have a child without having sex at all. Couples having trouble conceiving naturally can attempt to unite egg and sperm in a petri dish with the help of doctors and technicians at an IVF clinic. A single person, male or female, can have a biological child using donor egg or sperm and in some cases a gestational surrogate. A postmenopausal woman can have a child using either a donor egg or an egg of her own that was extracted and frozen during her fertile years. Those concerned about the possibility of passing on genetic diseases can use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to select only disease-free embryos to implant. And those who want a child of a particular sex or with particular genetic traits can do that as well. 
Now, with new gene editing technologies, it's possible even to genetically alter one's embryonic children, as has already been done, not without widespread controversy, by a Chinese scientist who altered embryos to make them resistant to HIV. Those genetically modified twins were born last October. And of course, the ability to create human life in a petri dish has also made possible widespread experimentation on human embryos for various purposes. Are these scientific developments good or bad, or a mix of both? Should we seek to craft public policies that promote and facilitate such practices, or policies that discourage or perhaps even forbid some of them? And what is at stake if we get these questions wrong? Some might argue that we should just let science govern itself and take a hands-off approach, but that, I think, would be a grave mistake. For what we're dealing with here are technologies that could literally alter the human race and that have already begun to alter our understanding of things as fundamental as the meaning of parenthood and the nature of family relationships, things that are fundamental not just for the well-being of individuals, but for the health of society as a whole. So I'd like to offer just a few ethical considerations that may help in thinking through such difficult questions. The overarching principle that I believe should guide our judgments in these matters is the requirement to respect the equal dignity of every human being. Now, human dignity is a fuzzy term, so let me clarify that when I say that all human beings have equal dignity, what I mean is that there are special moral norms that govern our interactions with human beings, norms like prohibitions on rape or torture or murder, norms that require us in various ways to respect the fundamental aspects of others' well-being. Arguably, all human beings have equal dignity because we all possess a rational nature. That is, we are all the type of being whose nature is oriented to the exercise of rational capacities, like the ability to think and make free choices. While humans are not all equal in their actualization or manifestation of these rational capacities, we are all equal in possessing the root capacity for rationality, regardless of state of health or stage of development. This idea that our rational nature sets us apart from other beings and grounds our fundamental dignity is in some ways a philosophical parallel to the biblical notion that all human beings have equal dignity because all are created in the image and likeness of God. For one of the basic attributes of divinity is the capacity to be an uncaused cause. We human beings share to a certain extent in this godlike capacity insofar as our rational nature enables us to act with genuine freedom to be the uncaused cause of our own actions through rational deliberation and choice. I don't have time to go into this in detail now, but I pointed out just to show how reason-based accounts of human dignity complement faith-based accounts. I emphasize the reason-based account because I believe that it's important in our culture to be able to defend the equal dignity of all human beings without having to rely on any particular religious faith. Now, given the equal dignity of all human beings, what are some of the ethical concerns raised by the sort of practices I described at the beginning? The first is a general concern about how such practices commodify human procreation and clearly fail to respect the equal dignity of embryonic human beings. Rather than, rather than fostering an approach to children as gifts, which we can hope for, but which we do not have a right to, an approach in which children are treated from the very beginning, that is from conception, as persons equal in dignity who deserve our unconditional welcome, love, and protection, reproductive technologies and their various forms facilitate treating children as commodities, as products of manufacture, or as raw material for research. By moving the site of procreation outside of the mother's body and into the lab, the embryonic human being becomes subject to the logic of manufacture and production. The logic of manufacture and production is about efficiency, quality control, maximizing profit, and giving customers what they want. These features are clearly present in assisted reproduction. There is, for instance, always an attempt to produce multiple embryos at once, even though this means that some will not be used, because it's more efficient to do, to do it that way than to attempt to produce only one or two at a time. Of all the embryos produced, the best, one or two, are selected for transfer into the woman's uterus, and sometimes pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is used to select for or against certain diseases or particular traits. The extra embryos are either frozen in case the individual or couple wants to use them at a later date, or they're discarded or donated for research. 
Sometimes when a multiple pregnancy occurs, an event which is much more frequent with assisted reproduction than with natural reproduction, a so-called selective reduction is performed. In other words, one or more fetuses are aborted to increase the chance that the others will survive or simply because the parents do not want that many children. Assisted reproduction is also a multi-billion dollar industry which seeks to make the paying customer happy, that is, the adult or adults seeking a biologically related child, and which exhibits little or no direct concern for the fate of the new human beings that it helps to create. Consider, for instance, that IVF was used in clinical practice without prior studies on primates or long-term outcomes. The first woman conceived through IVF is only about 40 years old, and larger longitudinal studies on health on outcomes are only now beginning to be published. One of those studies found that adolescents conceived through IVF had a higher risk of high blood pressure due to IVF-induced premature vascular aging. Who knows what other issues may arise as children get older. Reproductive technologies also make intentional single parenting possible through the use of donor sperm for women or donor eggs and a surrogate for men. In these cases, children are intentionally conceived in a way that cuts them off from one biological parent and half of their ancestry. Little thought is given to the psychological harms likely to result when children are deprived in this way of their father or mother, harms which are now becoming evident as the first generation of donor-conceived uh, children have reached adulthood. One study, for instance, found that donor-conceived adults are on, on average more confused about their identity and more isolated from their families than those raised by their biological parents or even than those raised by adoptive parents. And of course, the creation of children in the lab enables them to be subject to scientific experimentation, which harms or destroys them. It also makes possible the kind of human gene editing experiments done last year in China, experiments quite likely to result in lasting harm to the children produced and to all of their descendants. The use of donor eggs and surrogates to have children also involves the commodification of women and exposes them to significant physical and psychological harm. The high sums of money offered, especially for elite egg donors who are often college students or young professionals with student loans hanging over their heads, can be very hard to pass up. And many argue that offering so much money is exploitative. Indeed, the idea of selling such an intimate part of oneself is arguably in itself a threat to human dignity. That's why we use the language of donation, even though most donors readily admit that they wouldn't do it without the financial incentive. The same is true of gestational surrogacy. This has led many countries like France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and others to prohibit surrogacy entirely. Others like Canada, Australia, the UK, Ireland, Denmark, and Belgium prohibit paid surrogacy arrangements. The US, however, remains largely unregulated, leaving women extremely vulnerable to psychological, physical, and financial harm. Consider just one story, I'll leave Jennifer Lal to tell some more, um, the case of surrogate Crystal Kelly. Uh, the intended parents told Kelly uh, to abort the fetus when a five-month-old ultrasound showed that the fetus had a number of medical problems, including a cleft palate, a brain cyst, and a heart condition. When Kelly refused, they offered her an additional $10,000 to abort, and when she persisted in her refusal, they threatened to place the child in an institution after birth. Kelly sought legal help and was advised to go from Connecticut to Michigan, one of the few states in which custody is automatically granted to the gestational mother. So as her due date approached, she clandestinely fled to Michigan to give birth, where a family with a special needs child had already agreed to adopt the baby. There's much more that I could say about the ways in which these reproductive technologies fail to respect the equal dignity of women and children, but I know that Jennifer Law will have much more to add on this subject. Now, given the very real risks of these technologies, both assisted reproduction and gene editing for both individuals and for society as a whole, a hands-off libertarian approach to these issues seems ethically irresponsible. These issues are no more private than abortion is, and they deal with fundamentally the same concerns, the protection of the most vulnerable among us and the affirmation of the equal dignity of every human being, no matter how small. And because these technologies imply a radical transformation in our understanding of the meaning of parenthood and our approach to the next generation, what we ultimately need to ask ourselves is, what sort of a world is these technologies creating? And is this the sort of world that we want for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren? Thank you.
Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction to what I'm going to be talking about, which is the science. I'm going to give you a brief introduction into the science and technologies for which we have serious ethical concerns. As a scientist, I have worked alongside many colleagues in the lab at the bench in order to investigate the mechanisms of human disease. The underlying goal has been the same, whether we've been looking at leukemia, congenital heart disease, ischemic, ischemic heart disease. The goal has been the same in that we are hoping that by studying these mechanisms, that we will hopefully with time develop novel therapeutics and interventions that will treat the disease, that will provide heal without harm, that will bring comfort and care to the one suffering. This type of investigation has led to many amazing discoveries, but due to time, I can't tell you about all the discoveries, but just to name a few. Adult stem cells have been used to treat over 2 million individuals worldwide, Herceptin to treat breast cancer, and insulin for diabetes. Unfortunately, many diseases remain untreated. The FDA estimates that 70,000 rare diseases affecting approximately 30 million people in the US many serious and life-threatening, and half affecting children, still have no approved therapies. So how as scientists are we going to combat these diseases? Scientists need tools, and so I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the tools and how they can be used ethically and unethically. One of the tools is the human genome. The human genome is all of the DNA in a person's body that helps define who they are. We each have a unique genome, and these are the building blocks of life. And what's amazing is that this human genome is present from day one of development. What's shown here are the first 23 stages of development within the first eight weeks of embryonic growth. So from day one, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, every human being has a complete genetic DNA code that is unique and unlike another. The human genome will allow an individual to give rise to all the cells and organs in that body to have, be fully functioning. By four weeks, the, the patient will have a heart that is fully formed and beating. So why is DNA so important to studying disease? In studying the human genome of many individuals that do and do not have disease, researchers have found important DNA changes. And as a result, we have begun to create two categories for a disease, those that have a DNA change and those that do not. And so while this is nothing new, what's significant is that within the last few decades, there have been serious advances and in which now very robustly scientists can sequence the entire genome of individuals and they can analyze large groups of individuals without disease and with disease and now what they're finding is they can um, discover, they have discovered targets that cause the disease, which is shown here in red. And this can be a good thing if it's used ethically. This is what's called personalized medicine. It is what information and technology is used to select or optimize a patient's medical care. This can be used to diagnose disease, to develop treatments, therapies, and cures, to maximize benefits and minimize harms. In this wonderful example of this girl shown here, she was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia very soon after birth. But because they were able to specifically diagnose the disease, they were then able to use a very advanced form of therapy called CAR T-cell therapy, in which they take this little girl's T-cells and they genetically modify them and then put them back into her body so that they can actually target and kill the cancer cells. So she was healed without any harm to herself or to others. So how do we know what's right and wrong ethically in research? As scientists, especially when there are so many advanced technologies and when they're really, and when they are being advanced, and when they're, they're advancing at such breakneck speed. In response to a history of unethical medical research that was conducted in the United States and abroad, guidelines to ethical research were written and must be read and agreed upon by every researcher. There are three basic principles, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. And just to show you some of the quotes that were taken directly from the Belmont report, this means do not harm. Equals are to be treated equally. That respect for the immature and the incapacitated may require protecting them as they mature and while they are incapacitated. 
So it followed all human beings, regardless of stage, will receive the dignity and respect that they deserve, especially those that are the most vulnerable. When this balance shift, we see what I refer to as depersonalized medicine, in which now this information and technology that we have is, now is no longer used for good, but is and no longer used to optimize medical care, but is now harmful to the individual, to other persons, or to a population. This can result in eugenics, discrimination, and we are now seeing designer babies and, human and, and the risk for human enhancement. As shown in this example here, there are now amazing technologies that can, that can determine whether a baby has Down syndrome very early on while in the womb, simply by taking a blood sample from the mother. This can be used for good and that the mother can actually, and the parents can prepare for their baby uh, when they are born, any interventions that might have to occur. Some might be familiar with former Congressman Sean Duffy, who found out that their baby in utero that was just born um, suffered from congenital, from having um, holes in their heart because of Down syndrome. We commend them for keeping the baby and for working hard to use treatments that are currently available. Unfortunately, because of this technology, 30% of the, the Downs population um, has been reduced because several parents choose to abort once they find early on that they are carrying a baby with Downs. So what we are seeing is that this technology is being used in which we are now decreasing the occurrence of undesirable traits and increasing the occurrence of desirable traits, which is, in essence, eugenics. Another problem is that the preborn are not assigned the moral standing of full persons and are not given equal respect, right to life, and protection from harms. As Dr. Michelle very nicely and clearly um, discussed, in vitro fertilization is one of the technologies that places the early preborn at serious risk. It is a technique used to help couples who are not able to get pregnant on their own, um, the ability to help people that are not able to get pregnant on their own, and embryos are actually produced in a petri dish. Thousands upon thousands of embryos are produced in the US using this method, and so some have been successful. Many embryos are not used. And why is this? It's because many parents have the option of selecting the quote unquote perfect child. They can screen for the quality of these embryos. They can screen these embryos for quality. They can screen them for genetic disease using what Dr. Michelle described as pre-implantation genetic diagnostics or PGD. The goal is to avoid having a child with a genetic disorder. They can even choose the specific sex of the child. And these unwanted excess embryos can be donated for adoption, which is a wonderful alternative. But many of them, thousands of them, have been stored, abandoned, discarded, and destroyed for research. So here we see another example of how technology is being used to either increase or decrease those traits which we consider desirable or not desirable. Another technology on the horizon is the heritable genome editing, which uses CRISPR technology. This is a precise and easy manipulation of genes and gametes, which are the sperm and eggs, or embryos. It results in a DNA change which is permanently sealed in the germline. You're basically going in and you are taking out the piece of DNA within the genome that you don't want and you're pasting the DNA back together. There are many unknown implications with this technique. And as you may remember, the Chinese scientist, He Kui, in 2018 claimed to be the first scientist performed, who performed this technique on embryos that resulted in pregnancy and birth of twin girls. He received much rebuke from the scientific community, but this research is still very active and continues worldwide today. So the goal of germline editing is to prevent a disease or disability, to erase it, to erase what we don't want. But I ask, what disease, disability, and risk for adult onset do we erase? Where do we stop? No one is perfect. No one is devoid of mutations that contribute to some ailment that we face, whether now or in the future. I want to show you this example of these beautiful pictures of this little girl named Baby Blakely. She was diagnosed at 20 weeks with a rare genetic disorder in which her brain did not develop correctly. 
The doctors prepared the parents that baby Blakely would not live past birth, but she surprised them all, and she lived 10 months after she was born. At the eulogy, her parents, that are shown here in this picture, described how her life had purpose, her life was beautiful, and her life was worth living. So I ask, who are we to play God and decide what in our DNA gives rise to purpose and what does not? And if we can use this technology to prevent disease and disability and get rid of what we don't want, what's stopping us from making improvements that don't even treat disease? And that is, in essence, what enhancement would do, is that if we targeted genes that would actually hope to make us better, that would not prevent, treat, or mitigate the effects of any disease, but could maybe change our eye color, just make us have better eye vision, that would um, make us not bald or make us more intelligent or give us strength. Another technique that is on the horizon is three-parent embryos. This, again, is another technique in which we're hoping to get rid of the abnormal and replace it with what we consider normal. So in this case, a mother who has mit abnormal mitochondrial DNA, they take only the nuclear DNA, which they consider good, and then they combine that with the normal mitochondrial DNA from another woman. So now we have one egg that is made up of two moms. It is then fertilized with the father's sperm. So we now have an embryo that has the genetic information from three different parents. And in this instance, you see a physician here who actually went on to perform this technology in the United States, but went to Mexico for the baby to be born to avoid legal issues. So while many, um, they believe that their heart is in the right place and because they are only hoping to prevent mitochondrial disease, it has been very clearly stated in the literature that there is also interest in using this technology to increase fertility in in vitro fertilization procedures. Cloning is another way that embryos are, being, embryos are being manipulated in hopes of finding cures and medical therapies. Many may remember that decades ago, Dolly the sheep was one of the first animals that was cloned. But now in China, it's been reported that primates have now been genetically edited to create the genome that they want. And they have now been able to make clones of those primates. And scientists have also experimented with human hybrid pigs, rats, and mice with the goal to generate organs and transplantation. And now the world's first ever human monkey hybrid has been grown in a lab in China. In addition to embryos being manipulated for reproduction, cloning, and chimeras, they are also used as objects and means of experimentation in order to isolate what are called pluripotent stem cells so that they can study disease and potentially look for therapies. So thousands of these unique human beings that were created, they're either created and destroyed, they're created either by in vitro fertilization or are created in the lab and then destroyed in order to isolate what are called these embryonic stem cells. And in another example, organs and tissues from unwanted abortions are being used in research. In this one example, liver and thymus from aborted fetuses are implanted into mice in order to create what are called humanized mice to study infection and disease. But the amazing thing is that we don't need these unethical tissues and technologies because we can use non-controversial mechanisms and tools and techniques that will respect the value of every human life without destruction or harm. Some of these examples are the adult stem cells that I talked about earlier, the CAR T cell therapy that I discussed earlier, novel interventions to treat the baby in the womb using fetal surgery before birth, and tremendous in potential for disease modeling, gene correction, drug testing, and organ replacement is seen in induced pluripotent stem cells and, organi and organized, which are making incredible advancements in the literature today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Melanie and the Heritage Foundation for providing this opportunity for us to speak with you today. Um, in 1985, just seven years after the birth of Louise Brown in 1978, the world's first test tube baby, Gina Correa published her very important book titled The Mother Machine, Reproductive Technologies from Artificial Insemination to Artificial Wombs. 
Korea writes, we are in the midst of a dramatic biological revolution. Clinics for in vitro fertilization are springing up throughout the world. Physicians are artificially inseminating women, flushing embryos out of them, and transferring those embryos to other women. They hope to make a postmenopausal woman pregnant soon. IVF clinics in Australia, England, and the United States are freezing human embryos for later transfer. Plans are underway to fly embryos across the country so that, for example, an embryo flushed from a woman in Los Angeles and transferred into a woman in Massachusetts could happen. Commercial firms are offering the sale of surrogate mothers, she calls them breeders, to customers, some of whom are infertile couples and other single men. That was 1985. Fast forward to today and we find ourselves living in a multi-billion dollar international biotechnological revolution. The predictions of Korea have become a scary reality. For example, data from 2017 tells us that in the US alone, we have nearly one million frozen human embryos, with seemingly very few concerned about this. The global IVF market is expected to reach $36.2 billion by 2026. Now, postmenopausal women are getting pregnant. Last month, it was reported that a 73-year-old woman in India has just given birth to twins. A 2017 report shows that the U.S. commercial surrogacy is a $2.3 billion a year industry with no signs of stopping or slowing down as gay men now join infertile couples to buy eggs, rent wombs in order to buy a baby. And citizens from other countries that prohibit surrogacy flock to the U.S. Google, Anchor Baby, and surrogacy. In 2004, I began writing about egg harvesting procedures and the buying and selling of human eggs and the risk to women's health. This was at a time when our country was embroiled in what I call the great stem cell debate. My writings caught the attention of women in the United States who were financially struggling on university campuses, who responded to an ad often in their campus newspaper to make money and help somebody have a baby. These stories of short and long-term serious harms are featured in my documentary films, Exploitation and Maggie's Story. These women recount suffering massive strokes, emergency surgery to remove a torsioned ovary, hemorrhaging requiring additional emergency surgery, loss of their own fertility, and diagnosis of breast cancer, all of these which carry a risk of death. During this time, California, my home state, passed its Proposition 71 initiative called the California Stem Cell Research and Cures Initiative, which provided $3 billion of taxpayer funds for mostly embryonic stem cell research and human cloning research. With the uh, passage of Proposition 71, we were successful, however, in banning scientists from being able to pay women for their eggs for research purposes. Currently in California, women are only allowed to sell their eggs to help somebody make a baby. However, California legislators have now passed AB 922, which will allow women to be paid to sell their eggs for research purposes. The bill title is Reproductive Health and Research Oocyte Procurement. Oocytes are eggs. The irony is not lost on me. California wants to legally allow scientists and physicians to risk healthy young women's life and perhaps their own fertility in order to perform women's reproductive health research. Governor Jerry Brown twice vetoed this bill in California, concerned about the exploitation of low-income women because the researcher doesn't care if the egg donor has a high SAT score or if she's pretty. Brown opened his veto letter to the California Assembly saying, not everything in life is for sale, nor should it be. It's yet to be seen what our governor, um, our governor Gavin Newsom will now do, and he has until October 13th to act on this piece of legislation on his desk. But at the heart of the great stem cell debate was the mantra over these then half a million frozen human embryos that were just going to be thrown away anyway. I was, of course, very concerned about the ethics of embryo research, not only because it treats early nascent human life as a commodity, but also because where there's a human embryo, there's an egg. And where there's an egg, there's a woman, which comes at the risk of women's health. 
Countless women have been harmed physically and emotionally by advances in assisted reproduction, and many more will be harmed by these new emerging biotechnologies that you've heard a little bit about already. Have there been any clinical trials or studies on healthy women taking powerful fertility drugs to undergo ovarian stimulation? No. Is there a registry to track these women and follow up on them over the course of their health like we do with organ donors? No. It's a curious statistic to me that the majority of live organ donors are women, with men being the majority of recipients of donated organs. Are women expected to assume more risk to their health for our shared common good and the advancement of scientific research? Make no mistake, assisted reproduction exists today because of countless experiments done on women by their physicians, often without their knowledge or even their consent. Unlike new drugs or therapies or medical devices that come to market through the channels of, of institutional review boards and animal to human clinical trials to ensure safeties and protections, Women were literally guinea pigs, and they still are. John Buster, an OBGYN doctor at UCLA in the 1980s said, you understand this is done on cattle all the time. There's nothing new in any of this. It's all very feasible. It's just a case of setting it up. His message was, or is, if it's okay to do on cattle, well, then why not do this on women? Since there's been no research proving the safety or identifying the risk to women egg vendors, or even to women serving as surrogates, and by extension, the children born of these technologies, the approach has literally been a learn-as-we-go approach. One doctor in Lisa Mundy's book, Everything Conceivable, said in the early days of fertility medicine, it was like throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what would stick. We are only now learning that a surrogate pregnancy carries more risk than a natural pregnancy. And keep in mind, the surrogate mother is not an infertile patient. And she assumes these risks to her health, often, as you heard, for money. Egg donors and surrogate mothers have died in the United States. And this is still relatively new technology. And we are only now starting to get studies on how the children fare who have been created through assisted reproduction, challenging the narrative that the kids are all right. Just last month, I interviewed a woman as the market shifts, who in 2018 made the decision to harvest and bank her own eggs in order to beat her biological clock. She knew as a 36-year-old woman that her egg quality and her egg quantity was going to diminish, and she was not yet ready to start her family. This new technology is now being offered as an employee benefit in a lot of the companies at the, in the Silicon Valley. But unfortunately, this technology lacks the safety studies other medical procedures require. Now in 2019, the same woman has just been diagnosed with breast cancer. She's had a lumpectomy and a month's worth of radiation already. Doctors have told her that there's no evidence that taking these powerful fertility drugs to stimulate her ovaries so that they could harvest 31 of her eggs to freeze caused her cancer. What they should have told her, though, is that there's never been any studies on healthy women who are not patients. So in fact, we have no idea what the risks are to her and other women like her. She has also been told that now if she wants to have children, she'll have to use assisted reproduction in order to conceive. Women and children have been harmed with physical and mental injury. They have been wronged by being treated unfairly and unjustly and used as guinea pigs. And now with CRISPR, research advancing and gene editing of human embryos is here and now, women will be again required to provide the eggs to make the embryos in order to do the research. The late, great Princeton ethicist Paul Ramsey suggests this helpful distinction, distinction between experimentation versus actual treatment or therapy by suggesting women ask this question. Doctor, are you doing this for me, or am I doing it for you in your research? Ramsey also cautions against unethical research on human embryos who are not, of course, able to give consent. Dear, uh, Dr. William Hurlbut at Stanford University who served on President Bush's Bioethics Council, said in a recent interview discussing genetically modified babies, it's very troubling that the world is not more concerned. Maybe this is what you get when the news is reduced to trivia. And that is rather sickening, because these are monumental issues. This really is like no other news. It really is about the future of our species. Most things come and go, but this is going to be with us. That said, he goes, he goes on, I don't think germline genetic engineering 
<clears throat> unless it sails off into illegal fertility clinics, will be a major phenomenon, at least not for decades. The real issue remains to me the creation and destruction of human embryos for research. This is the core problem. The use of human embryos as tools, their instrumental use, continues to be overlooked. The trouble is, this is very important science, but it's not like studying something in a test tube. These embryos are living organisms. The use of human embryos to study developmental bi biology remains a huge story. And I would just close by adding that the use of embryos, and of course women, and their bodies as tools, should move us to re-examine what are the ethics in bioethics. Thank you. All right, well, because I have a microphone, I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question. Um, but we will have people um, moving about the room with the microphone. So if you have a question, again, just be sure to raise your hand, wait until you have the microphone, and then identify yourself and speak clearly. Um, I, I want to kick things off and take a step back because in our society and even within the conservative movement or the pro-life movement, there aren't necessarily, um, there's not consensus 100% across the board on all of these different issues, um, even among various religious traditions and denominations, there's still um, a lot of different opinions and, and thoughts about this technology. So where does that leave us in public policy? Um, and maybe y'all could talk a little bit about what the status quo is right now, what some of the laws and regulations governing this research is, how various state laws come into play, and even internationally, and what that means when there's conflict. So I can explain a couple of the um, federal restrictions that affect embryos in research um, and genome editing. So in 1996, um, uh, the Dicker Wicker, the Dickey Wicker Amendment was established, and so this uh, required that no federal funds would be used for the creation or destruction of human embryos for research purposes. Um, however, this does not ban any private or state funds, funds from creating or destroying embryos for research. In addition, in 2015, the Adderholt Amendment um, was instituted that, in which Congress prohibited the FDA from approving any genetically edited embryo, which would be a product that was destined for pregnancy, for implantation. Um, however, this does also does not, does not ban the continued use of using private funds to keep that research going and to experiment with these embryos and genome editing. Um, it also does not ban federal funds from using human embryonic stem cells that are currently available in the NIH registry that scientists can simply just purchase and use. Well, I could just add, um, because of my experience working in hospital nursing for so long, you know, that uh, a good return to proper medicine is also in order, and, th and that doesn't have to um, challenge um, left and right pro-life, pro-choice sensibilities. I mean, doctors have a do-no-harm fiduciary responsibility not to use one woman or anybody instrumentally for the gain of another. Um, I think as a matter of policy, we can, in, in the area where I work in particular, removing a lot of the commerce, the money. I mean, where else do you interface with a medical doctor who's offering you 10, 15, 20, 35, 50 thousand dollars to do something when you're not even a patient? Um, so I think we've sort of lost our way in, in the, the use of medicine um, that, again, I don't think has to divide us as a country and that we, as we can come around that issue of what, what's proper and good medicine. I think uh, related to that as well um, is the commercial aspect of fertility clinics in general, not just with regard to um, donation or really sale of eggs and sperm and uh, wombs and so on, um, but also the way in which uh, the development of in vitro fertilization has shifted uh, medical care of people with uh, fertility issues. Prior to that, the approach would be to try to find ways that actually got to the root cause of the problem, heal the root cause of the problem, and enable people to have children naturally. Now, because IVF is an option and a very lucrative 
option. I mean, couples will will tell you they sort of go to the IVF clinic and, you know, after having an explanation of the medical stuff, they'll sort of be seated down with financial people. It's kind of like buying a car, talking about the potential payment plan, because these are, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, $50,000 upwards of that even, because usually multiple cycles are required. And even then, there's no guarantee of, of success. It's quite lucrative. Uh, whereas there are, in fact, alternatives um, largely based on understanding better and sort of charting uh, what's going on with the woman's uh, body uh, during her, her cycle at various points in time to, to figure out what the root causes are. And many of these are treatable, sometimes very easily treatable, just with um, taking uh, various hormones and so on to, to achieve the correct hormone balance, sometimes very minor uh, surgeries uh, for endometriosis, for instance, but a lot of these things just go undetected in the standard medical practice. Um, and, and the kind of fertility treatments that actually uh, would cure these diseases are not well known uh, and are generally not covered by, uh, by insurance either. Fascinating panel. Brandon Showalter, Christian Post. <clears throat> My question is, certainly seems to me that uh, Americans, but even Christians, have a very disembodied outlook on life. They see all these cool scientific developments on the news, and they're like, ooh, how neat is that? They're doing this and this and this. My question to any of you who'd like to respond to it is, how do you think it's effective? What's an effective way to um, explain that when we get these core ideas about bioethics wrong, it results in tremendous harms. And how do we make the harms more visible and show that, you know, ethics really does matter and we have to think about these things because I think it people just sort of get sort of lost in the whole, oh, they're doing all this really neat cutting edge science and how can that be a bad thing because they're discovering new things and they're, I don't know, that's just my perception of it. So any, any comments, I'd appreciate it. I think one of the important issues that are on the table is transparency. I think it's very important. A lot of times people see how cool this science is, but then they're failing to educate the public and really explain to them what was actually done in the process to get to that. What actually, what, what materials were used in that process? That's a key part of information that's missing, not only to the public, but the scientists themselves. There are a lot of scientists, especially in training, that often are pressured to use materials, um, or because there is a lack of transparency, they don't even really know what they're using. And so this is really an inherent problem within the scientific community and within the public, that we need to create that transparency and we need to be open with the public, public and explain to them what exactly was done um, and what was used. That's one thing. Um, well, I appreciate Brandon as a member of the media. You know, that's one of the hardest um, battles that I have is getting the media to accurately and fully report the stories. I mean, why do we make documentary films so we can tell the stories of the women that we know who've been seriously harmed? We can't get the media overwhelmingly, especially the mainstream media, to, to present the negative or the downside. I mean, you see Kim Kardashian on People Magazine because they've just had their next baby through commercial surrogacy. You know, you don't ever see a picture of the surrogate mother you know, and, and hear how she was treated. You know, most of these surrogates that serve for these very high-profile, wealthy couples don't even know who they're carrying a baby for. You know, they, they're, they're bound to anonymity. You're carrying a baby for somebody who doesn't want you to know who they are. So, you know, part of it is we just keep through social media and the power of film telling stories to get the public up to speed because most people, left, right, religious, not religious, they just think this is all great. It's, it's progress. It's scientific advancement. It's developing cures. It's helping somebody have a child. And that's all that they're hearing. Um, yeah, I would just add uh, to that that accurate information and accurate reporting is extremely helpful. I mean, just thinking about the embryonic research debate, which is largely a debate of the past in some ways because of the development of induced pluripotent stem cells, but not entirely because, as you noted, these embryonic stem, these, embryo, these embryos are still being used for, uh, for research, even though now even more it's utterly unnecessary. Um, but there's so much hype, and in the, the heat of the debate about the use of embryos for, um, for stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, there was all this hype about all the diseases that were going to be cured as a result of it. And 
what has been found is that by and large, the actual clinical trials, the actual cures have come not from embryonic stem cells, but from adult stem cells or from induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so in the end, right, good science and progress in science, even in terms of the consequences and the outcomes, uh, went along with the ethical science. And there was just a lot of false promise in, uh, in the use of um, embryos uh, for research. So that, I think, is, is important to, um, to be sort of truthful about the actual potential of these things. Uh, and, and that's a requirement for scientists as well. They tend to hype this in part because they, they want to get funding and so on. Um, but then secondly, as um, Jennifer was saying, it's helpful to put a human face on these things, right? It, it can seem just very abstract to say, oh, you know, the dignity of the person and things like that. But when you put somebody face to face with a woman who was exploited by this process or a, uh, a now 20 some year old who was conceived with the sperm of an anonymous donor and who just feels really confused about identity, um, robbed of half of their biological heritage, robbed of important medical information that they ought to be able to know about themselves and so on, right? When you, when you give these people faces, um, that then really helps to bring it home that there are real human harms and human costs. This one over there. There we go. Hi, Steve Aiden for American United for Life. The law in most states, uh, with a couple of exceptions, allows both the couple who engage in ART and the doctor and the staff facilitating ART to treat um, the uh, nascent human beings created as property. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, uh, what the panelists think of a legal approach that would require the uh, ART facilitators and a gestating couple in a, uh, a, a divorce or a disagreement over what to do with those embryos to treat them as human beings and apply the best interests of the child or the embryo standard and ask the court in a case like that, a custody dispute or a dispute over the embryos to determine what would be in the best in interests of those embryos and how that might change the whole debate uh, in this context. Thanks. Um, well, that's, that's a great question, Steve. And you know, we actually have live cases right now, um, one in particular in Arizona that I think, if I'm remembering right, the Arizona Supreme Court has agreed to hear that case. So it'll be interesting um, to hear how that's resolved. It's you know an embryo custody battle dispute. It was a couple that created children with the intention of having children, and then they split up. And uh, and I, if I'm remembering right, it's the father of the embryo that doesn't want the children, and the mother does. So um, so far, a lot of these cases have looked at you know what did the couple intend? Well, in my mind, they intended to have children. That's why they created these embryos. So in the case of these kind of disputes, they didn't intend them to be discarded or to live in a freezer for 20 years or to be destroyed or to be donated to research. They created them to intend to have children. So if, if the court wants to stay in that lane of intention, um, then I think that that might be one way to skin the cat. I don't know. But I'm not a lawyer. There also is a uniform law commission that is in place right now to actually very critically um, examine and, and analyze how we are going to deal with the disposition of these embryos in court cases exactly like you discussed. Um, and I think, but I think there also are gonna be differences if we put it in the hands of the court, it's gonna depend on just how do they perceive that embryo? Do they perceive it as a person that is not just a piece of property, but is actually worth being used? Because that that individual um, doesn't have to be destroyed. It could actually go and be adopted for you know into, for embryo adoption. So um, I think it's a very important question, and hopefully some answers will come out soon. Yeah, I'm also I'm not sure how legally or politically feasible this would be at this stage, but I think a, certainly a good ethical argument could be made that. There's a reasonable time limit that could be, could be placed on these extra embryos that are in cryo storage um, when it's clear that the couple that created these embryos 
is no longer able to or willing uh, to even consider allowing those embryos to be born, why should they have the right to keep them, keep their lives literally frozen on hold when there might be other couples willing to adopt those embryos? So there could be a kind of uh, limitation period on the number of years that you could keep embryos in cryo storage before they automatically become available for adoption, which again would be helpful in helping people to realize, you know, these are, these are children. And there are also many other couples out there who would love to have children, who want to adopt, and why should these embryos have to be in storage um, when they could be given a chance at life? And I guess this is somewhat related to that. I know that there's a, a number of legal cases throughout the country and in instances where um, perhaps frozen embryos were accidentally destroyed because of a power failure, um, mm -hmm. and parents who had every intention of having children have unfortunately lost that opportunity because of a power failure or um, a human mistake or cases where they ended up having a child and came to find out that it wasn't the donor sperm they thought it was. It was mm. the clinic owner using his own sperm for mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of children all in the same geographical area going to school together not knowing that their half sibling mm. was in the classroom next door or um, cases where people have maybe even have had the wrong egg um, mm -hmm. or wrong embryo um, transferred and come to find out that their child is actually not biologically related to them at all. Um, and so do we think it's appropriate for courts to have to work through these cases um, on a case-by-case -case basis? There, there's so many questions about liability and damage, um, but at the end of the day, there's such a tragic human cost when, when things go wrong. So do we just leave this to courts to sort out? Um, is there really a good answer at all? I mean, there's also a very real concern about the lack of any, even the most basic kind of vetting of those who would seek to create a child through IVF. Um, it was a case that I recently heard about of um, a sort of known uh, sex offender uh, creating children through IVF. And so, I mean, there's, there's no background check, so any, any single person, really for any purpose, who has the money can create children, um, use them for whatever purposes he or she wants, because nobody is looking over uh, to, to vet uh, these situations. It's very different from adoption, which is a child-centered kind of institution. This is clearly an adult centered institution about allowing adults to have their desires uh, fulfilled. And it's obviously a wonderful desire to have a child, but the question is, are the means chosen there means that are respectful of the equal dignity of, of that child? Hi, thanks for your presentation. Greg Schlappenbach, US Conference of Catholic Bishops. This debate, both within science and within policy, tends to line up as pro-life and religious groups versus science, which is obviously a loser. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that it's very difficult for um, men and women of science who might agree with us on the ethics to actually step forward and say so out of fear of losing grants and mm -hmm. status and whatever. Um, first question is, do you think it's possible to generate some kind of a um, critical mass of men and women of science to have more of an impact in the ethics within the practice of research, as well as coming up with some policy, reasonable policy um, um, restrictions, guidelines? And, and secondly, what might you suggest would be some potential common ground on some kind of policy restrictions in this area? So I can tell you that, yes, this is an issue, that there are science, scientists and physicians that are not willing to step forward. But I think we have to remain hopeful that there are many that are. Um, so for, and there are uh, organizations that are, so for example, the um, American Association for Pro-Life OBGYN, the Christian Medical and Dental Association. These are um, organizations that are, um, that, that are, that, in, that, can, are, that are formed by you know, scientists and, and physicians that are working together to 
put and they they create guidelines and they, on their website and they have conferences and they work together to educate the public. Um, also, institutions you know like the Charlotte Bossier Institute. We know we're working very closely. We have you know 60 plus experts throughout the United States that um, help to educate and to form the policy that will. Um, that will stand up for these unborn. So I agree with you that it, it's unfortunate that there is often a division, you know, between religious and unreligious, or pro-life and not pro-life. But, um, but I can say that there are lots of people that are standing up for this. Um, but yes, more need, we are needed. More. We need more for sure. I don't think in terms of coalitions, probably Jennifer could speak to this more. But some of these issues, particularly the concerns about exploitation of women and so on are are issues that you can get a broad coalition of people. You can work with the sorts of people that you might usually be on opposite sides of these issues with, like radical feminist groups, for instance. Um, so I think there are also opportunities for reaching across the aisle on a lot of these things on, on specific elements of them. And I think we have science, <clears throat> excuse me, science on our side. I mean, there's been, in the last three, four, five years, some really important good um, reports coming out in prestigious, you know, fertility and sterility, which is like the gold standard industry journal for fertility medicine. Um, there's a perinatologist in Southern California who's done two very important studies out of Loma Linda, um, showing that the stories that I tell are also backed up by the scientific literature, that this is high risk, that, that this, is, this is harmful, this is dangerous. So I, I think, you know, scientists, I want to give them the benefit of the, doubt, of the doubt that they all want to do good research that will will benefit all of us. Um, so I think the, the evidence is on our side. And we're starting to get the studies out of the children that are created, not just the psychological studies, um, but also the medical studies and the, and the actual real medical risk to children created through these unique novel technologies. So that's on our side. And that's not a, 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 divis a division and left and right. That, that builds coalition. So women of all stripes who are concerned about women being harmed, women's health, women's well-being. Um, you know, so I'm very optimistic. And, and just kind of to add to that a point that was made earlier, that to remind and, and you know, to educate the scientists themselves that and remind them that, you know, there have been no FDA approved therapies that co have come out of embryonic stem cells or aborted fetal tissue and that there are these, all these other excellent alternatives. I think a lot of scientists just um, do not want to be told no. They don't want to be told that they can't use these tools. And so it's it's just constantly reminding them, but that's not working. This is what's working. And so hopefully with time that will become clear. <laughs> um, well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and go ahead and cut it off. We're at the um, 1 p.m. mark. Thank you all so much for being here today. And to those of you who were able to join online, I know that one hour is certainly not enough time to try to cover everything that um, we could cover for a topic like this. So I'm hopeful that in the future we'll be able to host more panels and more discussions to continue keeping this conversation going. So thank you to our panelists and thank you to all for coming.